The perfect images of happiness. Encouraging, even-tempered parents. Couples in harmony just being themselves. Smiling, helpful neighbors. Positive, forward-thinking colleagues. Everything life throws at them is an opportunity to express their best selves. Personal development is apparently the key to modern day happiness. This picture tells a story. It's gradually seeped into our culture. Coaches drum the message home. I'm going to show you what to do to reshape yourself. Relayed by endless advertising slogans and by educational methods and management techniques. Accent the positive. Even political manifestos. Let us make this the year when the positive defeats the negative. We're encouraged to find resources deep within ourselves to deal with life and be happy. Is personal development the face of a flourishing society in which happiness is at the center of our concerns? Or conversely, is it the mask covering a syndrome of a depressed society in which optimism has become an obligation? Why were you suicidal? <sighs> it's because I can feel very peak state in life, but I can go so deep that I don't see a way out. If you give yourself just a little bit of time, and if you'll be a little more loving to yourself, I think you're gonna find you got a lot to give. I can fucking feel it. So you and I are gonna make a deal. I'm gonna show you what to do to reshape yourself. Anthony Robbins is the most famous life coach in the world. His job consists of making people happy. His story is prophetic. As a teenager, he was driven from home by an abusive and alcoholic mother, and he became a multimillionaire by helping others. His self-help programs, promising happiness, love, and wealth, have sold 35 million copies since the 1990s. Since then, his personal power audio program has helped hundreds of thousands of people master their finances, improve the quality of their relationships, and achieve peak physical performance. Personal Power with Anthony Robbins. In a career spanning 45 years, Tony Robbins has motivated showbiz stars, politicians, a princess, billionaire business leaders, and sports champions. It costs between six and $8,000 to take part in one of his week-long seminars. These high masses are the most spectacular version of a fashionable movement. Personal development. Personally, I wouldn't go and listen to Tony Robbins because it's just a show, a sort of collective manipulation, which I don't particularly like. And there's this very close attention to running one's, one's mind and body like a sort of sports car, so that everything has to be a, a kind of carefully uh, tuned machine uh, and, and everything has to be brought up to, to peak performance. Après, However, once I calm down and think about it a bit, then I focus not on if I like it or not, but on what psychological help it's bringing. Are those in the room going to leave there with tools to make them happier? Or are they going to leave with some stupid ideas that will complicate their lives? I actually think his ideas do some good. I think in some ways a threat to a more kind of vibrant, vital, romantic idea of what a human being is. Do something really silly. Put both your hands on your hips like Wonder Woman or Superman or that stuff, right? If you stand like this and you breathe deep for just two minutes... Boosting the egos the of his followers with concrete advice... You will absolutely increase your testosterone by 20%, man or woman. 
is the Tony Robbins method. His huge success has inspired a new generation of coaches who hand out life advice on internet. I want to help people. How you can be at your best more of the time. Smile more. You are here to thrive and to feel good. There are more than 70,000 of them officially listed around the world. And it's a market with an estimated worth of 3 billion euros a year. Fly-by-night YouTubers compete for attention with international entrepreneurs, aiming to set themselves apart with their original techniques. Such as the Japanese expert Marie Kondo, who's become a millionaire by giving out house tidying tips which bring happiness. You need to know from folding techniques to discovering what sparks joy for you. In a more traditional style but equally lucrative, the legendary Lise Bourbeau. Bonjour, je suis Lise Bourbeau, je suis la fondatrice de l'école de vie Écoute ton corps que j'ai créée en 1982. Lise Bourbeau's books of advice for well being have sold more than 6 million copies in over 30 countries. For many years, if you browsed bookshops, you'd see that the bestsellers all had political themes. Nowadays, more and more books deal with issues of psychology and well-being. This marks a big societal change, highlighting the question of what is a healthy life. What this tells us about our society is almost certainly that we are very lucky. In other words, that we live in societies, in the West at least, which are fortunate to be peaceful ones. So once survival is no longer threatened, on the physical, material side, you can start to take an interest in personal development. Coaching exists for dating, for makeup, for nutrition, for getting a job. In all walks of life, we need a coach. It would be incredibly naive to think that all these books can make us happy. But people aren't stupid. They don't buy the books to become happy. Above all, they read them to feel less alone. Authenticity is more beautiful than perfection. Happiness is not a destination, it's a journey. Each day is a new opportunity. Cultivate your deep personality. Learn to love yourself. Smile, and life will smile back at you. Happiness doesn't come to those who sit in Love will always triumph. In bookshops over the last decade, more and more shelf space has been dedicated to personal development. Let's be ourselves, just ourselves. Full of aphorisms to boost our egos. In the US, the number of books on sale has tripled and has now reached over 80,000, most of them written by coaches. When I actually um, decided to kill myself, I went and got a kitchen knife and I dug into my wrist. Their authority for handing out advice on being happy is based less on academic qualifications and more on life fun. experience. Let me tell you, I was just an emotional wreck. I was just crying and sobbing and... I used to go to the food bank for food and I thought my life was over. It felt like my entire life had ended. I was actually fearing that a nuclear bomb was going to be dropped onto LA and you know, who knows... Hitting the bottom and rising know, back to the surface has enabled them to understand the keys to happiness and entitled them to share these recipes. And in that very moment, I experienced like this un... this inexplicable peace. I needed this low to help me help everybody else. Losing that job was probably the greatest gift of my life. And my life is pretty much a dream. I mean, fair enough, it could be a Bradley Cooper, but that's just a matter of time. Usually the big sort of self-help gurus would have a life story like that. You uh, find yourself in uh, awful, terrible, uh, circumstances and despite of that you're able to reach your full potential and become this model of the super happy human being. So all this goes back to the fundamental discourse of our society which is based on individualism and which, when faced with a problem, says that the correct question to ask is not who or what is responsible, but rather, what can I do personally to get by? Or even, how can I turn this problem or disability to my advantage, to enable me to be a different, better person? You have no reason to complain 
the only person that is a barrier to your own success is yourself. Stop making up excuses. Take your own responsibility. Pull yourself up your bootstraps and make something extraordinary about your life. Take control of your life. Take control of the opportunities. Believe in yourself. What benefits for our self-esteem can we hope to gain from all these recipes? Repeatedly conveyed by advertising slogans, exhorting us to give the best of ourselves in order to be happy. Personal development is simply the popular version of the science of happiness, a genuine domain of academic research born in the late 1990s under the impetus of American psychologist Martin Seligman. Well, when I was um, about 11 years old and my older sister Beth was at college, she brought, brought home Freud's introductory lectures and I read them, couldn't put it down. I got to the part where uh, Freud talked about teeth falling out dreams. They have a meaning and the meaning they have is guilt over masturbation. And so I said, that's amazing. How, how does he know me so well? And uh, I think I decided at that point I wanted to spend my life working on great questions like that. Until the historical turning point initiated by Martin Seligman, psychology, the science that seeks to heal our minds, was chiefly based on the theories of Sigmund Freud in particular on his discovery of psychic forces which escape our consciousness. Forces which are supposedly the source of our guilt-inducing dreams and also of anguish, neurosis, and even psychosis. I discovered some important new facts about the unconscious out of these findings through a new science, psychoanalysis, But a hundred years after the discovery of the unconscious mind, psychology is in the doldrums. Doctor, ces malades qui défilent dans votre cabinet sont-ils pour la plupart des gens mal dans leur peau? Essentiellement. Vous apportez des réponses à ces malades. Nous les laissons les trouver, ces réponses. We criticize all sorts of psychologists, psychiatrists, therapists, analysts for not providing tangible results, as Woody Allen, an avid therapy goer, is forced to admit in Annie Hall. Wait, you see an analyst? Uh, yeah, just for 15 years. 15 years? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to give him one more year and then I'm going to Lourdes. 15? Nah, come on. You're, yeah, really? It was during this declining period for his speciality that in 1998, Martin Seligman took over as head of the APA, the extremely powerful American Psychological Association. Even though he'd spent most of his career on depression, Becoming one of the leading world specialists, Seligman changed track and invented a new discipline, positive psychology. Freud and Schopenhauer had thoroughly told us that the best you could ever do in life was not, not to be miserable. And indeed, as a clinical psychologist, uh, I, I was sometimes successful in uh, alleviating misery. Did I get a happy person? No, I got empty people. Before positive psychology was sort of was born, um, there was a great deal of emphasis in psychology on negative things, you know, on studying, you know, stress and like what relieves stress, on mental illness. Marty Seligman and Mike Csikszentmihalyi came along and they said, why don't we also study the positive side of life? Precisely what Seligman was, was arguing when he, when he began it was to say there was so much interest amongst psychiatrists and psychoanalysts and psychologists in neurosis and deviance and unhappiness of various kinds, but we need to know more about what makes people happy. <laughs> Just like laughter yoga, most methods which aim to develop our positive attitudes have grown out of behavioral therapies and practical conditioning exercises. 
But Martin Seligman wanted to go beyond these approaches, which he considered too mechanical for humans, and understand how the psyche influences our attitude to existence. <laughs> In a seemingly desperate situation, why do certain people give up fighting so quickly and even let themselves die, whereas others never give up hope? So in the 10 years of experiments we did on people and animals, making them helpless in the laboratory with loud noise or inescapable shock or unsolvable puzzles, we consistently found that only uh, two-thirds of people became helpless. One-third of people I could not make helpless in the laboratory. What is it about those people that makes them resist helplessness? Because if we could figure that out, then we could teach it to the people who became helpless. <laughs> In his research, Martin Seligman deduced an apparent tautology. Faced with a difficult situation, people who don't get depressed are optimists. He then deduced that in mammals, and particularly humans, optimism is a quality which can be learned. The aim of positive psychology is to invent tools to help us develop this optimism, synonymous with the power to act. What human beings have is they can learn mastery. And what's importantly mammalian and very importantly human is that we have cognitive structures that provide hope that tell us, hey, you can do something here. Et donc, on comprend bien la logique. The logic uh, is easy to understand. Talking with patients about the areas that hurt and dwelling on them, which is what happens in the psychoanalysis of difficult problems, family issues, and so on, only helps to reinforce the problems to some degree. So if you want to help people, concentrate on the positive aspects. In my laboratory, we do uh, experiments that are called happiness interventions. Uh, another way to think about them are like, they're kind of like clinical trials. But instead of testing, say, a new vaccine, we're testing a new happiness strategy. So for example, we ask people to act extroverted for a week. So this week, the next week, just sort of act more extroverted, talk more, be a little more energetic, be more assertive. And then the week after that, act more introverted, kind of be a little bit more thoughtful and um, uh, before speaking. We found it that, uh, during the week that people acted extroverted, they became much happier. Uh, during the week that they acted introverted, they actually became a little bit less happy. And interestingly, this was true for both introverts and extroverts. Um, now, it's only for a week. It's possible that if we ask people to do this over the course of like much longer, um, then the introverts would, would have gotten sort of fatigued, you know, kind of tired, uh, or just, you know, didn't want to do it anymore. Smile Life, Ozen. Happify, Mindshift, Allobud, hundreds of apps which claim to be based on the research in positive psychology. The apps encourage us to share our happy moments and to note down our moods in order to better regulate them. They suggest ideas which will give us instant gratification, ping alerts to remind us to savour the moment and send life-affirming messages. Some of them record our physiological data, such as our heart rate, enabling us to evaluate precisely the evolution of our emotional states, which in turn provides figures for the happiness scientists to work with. Headspace, the most popular of these apps, has been downloaded by more than 70 million people. Some days meditation will feel easy. On others, it might feel difficult. There are quite a few contemporary thinkers who've made some very pertinent comments on this idea of the obligation to be happy, which some people find difficult. Because if I don't manage to be happy, then somehow I failed again in my life. There's an onus on being happy. And if we're not happy, it's double jeopardy. Not only are we not happy, so we have to deal with that, but also we come across as a loser or a contrarian who refuses the modern-day hedonistic trend. So if you're 
constantly monitoring, am I happy yet? Am I happy yet? How happy am I am? It's kind of like weighing yourself all the time or like checking the stock market every hour, you know? You just sort of don't want to keep like looking at that, checking it, tracking it. We live in a society that believes that in order to be a good human being, you have to be healthy and you have to be happy. And that means that that is a society that is not only favoring and privileging people who achieve that, but is also demonizing and suffering people who don't do that. Dr. Amen is a psychiatrist. He's a New York Times best-selling author and founder of Amen Clinics with nine locations across the United States. Where your mind is the Dr. Amen is the most media-friendly American psychologist and the most controversial. His fame highlights the elevation of the urge to give the best of oneself in all situations, a decree legitimized by science and exploited commercially. The show which he hosts with his wife, Tana Amen, advocates optimizing people's emotional and mental capacities. Every week we're going to give you tips and tools to help you have a better brain and a better life. You're not stuck with the brain you have. You can actually make it better and we can prove it. Thanks to the use of brain spect imaging, the psychologist has been able to diagnose what has been preventing his clients from achieving happiness. Brain spect imaging gives us a new way to understand and treat your symptoms so you can... Dr. Amen holds the world record for the number of brain scans feel. carried out, so after I got my more scan, than 200,000. Once the diagnosis has been made, he prescribes ad hoc medicine to his clients, essentially food supplements in the form of pills. It was my brain. Today, one American in six regularly takes medication to regulate their emotional state and thus better comply with the ideal of personal development, that of the individual who is always optimistic and willing. Come on, Dad! What are you, what are you so up about? You're very happy. I'm happy. No, you're so up, 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 up. Isn't that a good thing? No, no, you're just up, 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 up. I don't, I don't know what, what that is. Are you taking the proper dosage of your medication? I think it's totally reasonable to link the birth of certain concepts of personal development to the ideas of the famous melting pot that was created during the first years of colonization of what is now the United States by the wasps, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who left Europe and arrived on the continent with the aim of founding a new society. Self-help is America, and America is self-help. It is where this concept is, is born in the 19th century, but it is especially here in the United States that it booms and becomes really big in the 1930s. America. El Dorado. The Far West the gold rush. For the Protestant migrants who had fled Europe, the new continent was the land where everything was possible. But even though it seemed that a heaven on earth was theirs for the taking, its bounty still had to be extracted from the land. The country was built on the strength of willpower. It was here that the expression self-help was invented and which has evolved into the expression personal development. For the reformist wasps, hard labor was simply what was expected from them, but wasn't seen as suffering to be endured in austerity, but as a liberation and a fresh opportunity for fulfillment. In the first Declaration of Independence of the United States, there were three fundamental rights clearly set out. The right to life. No one had the right to take your life away. The right to liberty. No one had the right to prevent your freedom of movement. And the right not to happiness, but the pursuit of happiness. 
they had this ingrained Calvinist view that what God wanted was not someone who prayed or someone who was detached from the world, but someone who was hardworking, committed, someone whom we would probably call nowadays a crypto or proto-capitalist. Little House on the Prairie is an iconic example of these pioneers who smiled at life and manufactured their happiness. Everything was possible for those who gave themselves the means, as shown in the television series adapted from the emblematic novel. And yet, at the very moment that the original version of this seminal story appeared in 1932, the Great Depression had put a quarter of the American population out of work and plunged millions into poverty. In the social reality of the time, the right to the pursuit of happiness says less about the prudence of Americans faced with an increasingly uncertain future and more about their invincible belief in the strength of will. It's a call to everyone to take their destiny into their own hands and bear responsibility for their successes and their failures. This was a study by Glenn Elder and his students from Berkeley. And what they did was a multi-generational study looking at grandparents, parents, and children uh, uh, where the grandparents grew up in the Great Depression. And uh, these were all people who uh, lost their income during the Great Depression. But some of the children and grandchildren came out of poverty and succeeded. And it turned out it was the optimists uh, among the children and grandchildren uh, that seemed to be the most important causal variable in coming out of poverty. The really, really big self-help title that comes out in the 1950s is Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking. Published in 1953, becomes a huge bestseller, influences people all across the United States. Poor people who would take the book and think that I could stop being poor I could become any person I want. There were dozens of books telling the story of what we call today the self-made man. Stories that recount how someone, with the sweat of their brow, pulls themselves up from the dregs of society to get to where they are today. The Pursuit of Happiness, as inscribed in the U.S. Constitution, is the title of a film in which Will Smith plays out the real-life story of Chris Gardner. Man, I got two questions for you. What do you do, and how do you do it? <laughs> I'm a stockbroker. Stockbroker? Oh, I had to go to college to be a stockbroker. Chris huh? Gardner, yeah, brought up to. in a poor family, became one of Wall Street's people. brazen traders who yeah. made a fortune hey, in speculation. Care. Hey, I'm going to let you hang on to my car for the weekend, but I need it back for Monday. Feed the meter. <laughs> Set up as a model, the self-made man is the epitome of someone who combines happiness with successful social status. I still remember that moment. Which is the just reward granted to those who most deserve it. They all look so damn happy to me. Max and Lion. The only difference between them and the Rockefellers is a few hundred million dollars and about 1,500 miles. And then there's Lion. But the glorification of winners in American society inevitably creates a new category of citizens. The scarecrows, the renegades, the misfits, the losers. A new breed of Hollywood directors depicted these magnificent losers, thereby creating a whole new genre, the portrait of those who no longer believe in the American dream. Rocky, 
Do you believe that America is the land of opportunity? Yeah. Derrière cette idée, behind this democratic idea, in which everyone is able to access their inner resources, there is a form of meritocracy which takes hold. And of course, it is possible to be critical of this idea of meritocracy, because there's something intrinsically violent about it. If everyone has the inner resources, the fact that some people have managed to sort out their problems while others haven't, then it comes down purely to individual responsibility. Positive psychology, in this very basic sense, goes very, very well with a conservative ideology that wants to normalize social and economic inequality, that wants to say that, well, if you are poor, then that's your choice. Taken up by coaches of all kinds, happiness has become part of the vocabulary of performance. In the image of the United States itself, whose economic power and endless growth is based on the unleashed potential of its population. It's become a mantra, echoed from the bottom to the top of the social ladder, a philosophy of life. This is how American liberalism should be understood. The right of everyone to pursue happiness is an accepted form of competition from which natural leaders will emerge victorious and drag the rest of humanity towards progress. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> In Greco-Roman history, if you start with uh, the Iliad, uh, what you find is that the gods have control, that Achilles isn't doing things, that agency rests with the gods. But if you go to the Odyssey, Odysseus actually has a lot of agency. And then when you get to the tragedians and the golden age, you got an enormous amount of human agency. And then when you get to the early Christian Roman philosophers, these are enormously optimistic, agentic people. An individual can even get into heaven and be saved by their own action. And indeed, it correlates with progress. So when ages are highly agentic, that's when progress occurs. When people don't believe in their own agency, that's when there's stagnation. The first to support positive psychology were billionaire entrepreneurs. They signed up to the school of thought, which associated happiness with agency, the power to act, and free will such as Chuck Feeney, the inventor of duty-free stores in airports, or the ultra-conservative John Templeton. All my life, I was trying to help people get wealthy, and up to a little success. But I never noticed it made them any happier. Then he what or Donald fire. Clifton, nicknamed the grandfather of positive psychology, who was a professor of psychology before making his fortune, thanks to a coaching method inspired by Martin Seligman's research. The Clifton Strengths Test Method has been adopted by 90% of the 500 largest American businesses. It supposedly enables each of us to identify our five most predominant strengths among 34 possible ones. For example, our sense of responsibility or our charm, and it encourages self-esteem right up to self-love. I think for me, the life-changing thing has been discovering that my natural self is awesome and being my natural self actually achieves that excellence and that success that I had always hoped for in my life. Predictably, it's via the world of business that the recipes of American personal development are shared. The globalization of the free market economy has gone hand in hand with the globalization of management methods, which celebrate unfettered competition while reinforcing the mindset of its employees. The seeds of interest in management psychology were sown in the 1930s, following an experiment carried out on employees of Western Electric, which studied the link between lighting in work areas and the quality of work. The premise was that output would improve if the lighting of work areas was improved. The study wasn't able to single out the optimal type of lighting, but uncovered a surprising phenomenon. The simple fact of showing interest in workers' well-being led to an increase in productivity. 
and most, in general, output increased wherever these tests were tried. A new era of management was launched, where the mood of employees became a determining factor in the productivity of the business. The virtues of team spirit were extolled in the New Age 1970s. And its more robust version, team building, in the 1990s. More recently, the quality of the work environment with the organization of convivial and recreational activities has come to the fore. As has the notion of gratitude as a technique for reinforcing good behavior. That good thing you just did, ooh, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Go do that again. And people will do that again today, three more times. So being concerned with how happy your employees are is important for lots of reasons. I mean, one is you can say it's kind of a moral good, right? It's sort of it's good for the world, it's good for society that people are happy. But it's also good for the company's bottom line because happy employees are more productive, they're better organizational citizens, you know, they're less likely to burn out and, and leave the company. If you apply the lens of capital to thinking about one's happiness, um, then you come to see um, happiness as something where certain forms of investment can be made, but that somewhere further down the line, there will be some kind of productivity uh, payback. There will be some return on that investment. If the CEO wants to make their employees happy um, and their incentive is that the employees are going to be more productive, like, I think that's fine. Like, I don't really care. Like, great, like, we have more happiness and more productivity. And by the way, productivity is also good for the world as well. Uh, in the end. There's an extraordinary paradox. There's never been so much attention paid to the well-being of employees, and there's never been so much unhappiness in the workplace. We're not talking about short spells of sick leave, but long-term sick leave. So the whole society, especially the way we work together in companies and organizations, are favoring people not to be critical, favoring people not to stir a mess. The much more important problems, such as union issues, for example, are not being dealt with. It's true to say that personal development tends to take the place of the more social questions, such as working hours, holiday pay, and so on. One in ten workers in both Germany and France admit to psychological distress in the workplace. A quarter of the working population in the US has already experienced burnout. The increase in workplace unhappiness in parallel with positive coaching are symptoms of a vicious circle in which the kindness of management, albeit in a more and more difficult climate, attempts to allay the violence of economic competition. So is the ever-present search for happiness just a first world problem for countries which no longer experience famine or war? Or is it a smokescreen for societies who have lost their way and in which not only work, but all human activities are driven simply by a quest for perpetual optimization? Now, most people would agree that uh, happiness is an important, maybe the most important part of life. But is it so important that we should have a minister in charge of our mental health mm. at the very heart of government? Well, that's what Lord Layard is calling for. He's a leading economist who's been looking into ways of improving... Thanks to this man, Richard Layard, happiness has crossed over from the business sector into in politics. Kind of, uh... World specialist in the well-being of populations, Layard is also the founder of CEP, the Centre for Economic Performance. What do we do at the Centre for Economic Performance? At the CEP, the pursuit of happiness is the undisputed goal of the economy. Professor Lord Richard Layard, the founder of CEP, asked, how can we make the world a happier place? I mean, Layard is an interesting character because he—I mean—he's been a—he's a, been at the top of uh, his his discipline and his profession for a long time, for decades. But he, during the 1990s, uh, he had this kind of curious uh, sort of road to Damascus moment, this kind of change of of, of attitude towards his own discipline. About uh, 30 years ago, 
the psychology of happiness took off like a, a, a rocket, an extraordinary explosion of knowledge. Uh, and uh, as an economist, of course, I was always looking for this, waiting for this moment. And, and when it came, uh, I moved into, into this field. Richard Laird in England, he would just show up at positive psychology gatherings. And we were together in Glasgow once, walking around Glasgow, and he said, uh, science catches on when the data are adequate and the political will is there. The political will is now there to work on happiness and well-being. Your data are at adequate. I'm going to take positive psychology to England. This is how we came uh, to have what is called an official national statistic. There are not many of those. There's a GDP, a few others. But to have uh, the well-being of the people included as a national statistic was a big step. David Cameron was the first to understand the political capital of borrowing ideas from positive psychology and integrating the well-being of the individual into his party's manifesto. Former advisor to Margaret Thatcher, Cameron represented the left wing of the Tory party. In 2010, during his election campaign, his preoccupation with the happiness of the British people became the trademark of the party's social vision. On being elected, David Cameron announced the setting up of tools to measure the well-being of the British population. The national census included some unprecedented questions. For example, overall, how happy did you feel yesterday? Today, the government is asking the Office of National Statistics to devise a new way of measuring well-being in Britain. And so from April next year, we'll start measuring our progress as a country not just by how our economy is growing, but by, by how our lives are improving. And yet that same autumn in 2010, Cameron announced the implementation of the most severe austerity program the country had witnessed since the Second World War. And at the same time, inspired by positive psychology, the government launched a vast national program designed to improve the mental health of the unemployed. There were certainly quite a few instances of what were called behavioral activation programs, where um, people, in, as a condition of receiving their unemployment benefit payments, they were forced to sign up to these kind of motivational uh, positive thinking uh, programs. You have so many examples, also in Sweden, where consultants and coaches have been paid huge amounts of money to train unemployed people to learn the mantra that unemployment is not a political problem, it's not a social problem, it's a problem that is inside their head. Nowadays, in order to help people, the tendency is to develop their capacity to become actors of their future. So rather than just giving them money, they're encouraged to sign on to workshops with coaching in how to find jobs. For example, they'll learn how to present themselves better or how to make a good resume so that they'll no longer say, I'm unemployed, but instead, I'm presently looking for exciting job opportunities. They were forced to, um, you know, stand in a room and, and chant certain kind of sort of, you know, self-esteem slogans like, you know, uh, the only limits I face are the ones I set for myself and nobody ever drowned in their own sweat and, you know, it's go hard or go home. And that was a pretty dark moment in the kind of confluence of, of the state and the labour market and uh, positive psychology. In the context of the global economic crisis, the subject of the happiness of a country's citizens has made its way into the political sphere. Si le loisir n'a pas de valeur comptable, 
parce qu'il est essentiellement rempli par des activités non marchandes, comme le sport ou la culture. On met le critère du productivisme au-dessus de celui de l'épanouissement humain à rebours des valeurs humanistes dont pourtant nous nous réclamons. The Stiglitz Report, which French President Nicolas Sarkozy commissioned in 2008, recommended adding to the standard economic goals, such as GNP, statistics indicating the population's perception of its own well-being. Cameron in England, Sarkozy in France, uh, uh, Kevin Rudd in Australia, uh, all took on positive psychology and asked the question, uh, let's do more than just increase the GDP of France or of England or of Australia. Let's increase the happiness. Parties of the right in particular um, in France and, and the UK, after the financial crisis, were looking for ways to, to position themselves as being somehow sort of, not kind of anti-capitalist, of course, but nevertheless wanted to sort of express some greater concern for society or compassionate conservatism, as, as George W. Bush would, would call it, and, and to try to signal that there was some potential change of direction after the financial crisis, because most people recognise the financial crisis was driven by uh, greed, by excessive payment at the top and this sort of stuff. I think ultimately it was a kind of a, it was a, it was a smokescreen, it was a, it was a useful ideological veneer. Any politician who wants to uh, remain in power or to achieve power should be designing their policies so as to maximize the happiness of the people. For me, the politics of positive psychology which says that the first duty of a good government is not military or economic, it's to raise the well-being of all the citizens. That seems to me uh, the right kind of politics and uh, the politics that in times of prosperity will prevail. Built out of the desert sand in only a few dozen years, the modern city of Dubai seems to be constructed around the image of modern day happiness. So open for fun, it's open for happy, open for crazy. Even the slopes are open, it's open for a guaranteed sun. Just like Florence in the Renaissance or Paris in the Roaring Twenties, it's possible to see behind the surface glamour the modern vision of the human aspiration to happiness. Here in the United Arab Emirates, a small petrol-rich country where the death penalty by stoning is a possible punishment for adultery or homosexuality, the World Government Summit meets, bringing together renowned specialists in psychology, economics and politics to discuss human happiness. Dhiyufuna al-kiram, nahnu fi dawla al-Imarat al-Arabiyya al-Muttahida, nu'man. أن الوظيفة الأولى للحكومة والهدف الأسمى لعملها هو تحقيق السعادة أن يمثل حوارنا اليوم نقطة الانطلاق لرحلة تساهم في إسعاد أكثر من سبع مليار شخص حول العالم. In 2018, Uud Al Rumi, the world's very first Minister of Happiness, announced the intention of the UAE to open the path of happiness to humanity. This aspiration reflected the obvious ambiguity of advocating happiness for people, while at the same time ignoring any questioning of the inequalities and injustice prevalent in the political sphere. The advocates of happiness and their critics have both pointed out a dilemma. On one hand, the need for individuals to be able to confront life's trials and tribulations on a daily basis, and on the other, the urgency of collectively rethinking society. So happiness is beneficial, not just for the individual, but for their families, for their friends, and for their community. So when you put a bunch of individuals together that are happier, the, the sort of the neighborhood, the community, and the society they create is, is going to be, I think, sort of a healthier 
kind of more uh, more positive society, more moral. Actually, happier people um, seem to be more moral as well, uh, which is interesting. Cette conception, as a sociologist, I would question this idea that collective action would somehow magically come about as the result of the accumulation of a series of individual behaviors. It's even a bit worrying. In psychology, we always research the individual and ask, for example, what would help them to become even happier or have a more fulfilled life. But sometimes the pursuit of one's own happiness can impinge on the happiness of others. There is indeed a dilemma here if it turns out that one's happiness comes at the expense of others. One of the elements which results from the success of personal development and the value of individual action is the gradual devaluation of collective action. And somehow, this is where personal development gives us room for maneuver, at least on the surface. Facing collective or individual adversity, we have the opportunity of changing the way we look at the situation. Look around and see what's there Smell the flowers, feel the air If life appears